All right. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and get, get moving before it's too late. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Um, thank you all for staying. Uh, we're going to talk tonight, continuing our journey through the New Testament, and do a little overview of St. Paul's epistle to the Philippians. Um, the, is that short? Okay. So, uh, the epistle to the Philippians was written by St. Paul and St. Timothy. And if you notice that, in the very first verse, what it says is, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ, right? Um, one of the interesting things is that over the last couple centuries especially, there's been a great deal of energy put into, primarily by, by Western scholars, started in Germany and has kind of spread from there. A whole lot of energy in trying to figure out which of St. Paul's epistles were actually written by him and which were written by other people. Now, of course, this is ridiculous, but why are they doing this? Well, because they're noticing for the first time to them that the style of Greek, the style of writing in St. Paul's various epistles changes. Okay? And these German and English and French speakers and so on act like this is such a revelation, as if there haven't been up to that point, 1,800 years of Greek speakers, fluent Greek speakers, people who speak Greek far greater, better than they do in multiple different dialects, reading it, noticing that the style of the Greek has been different all that time, and never having any concern over the fact that this was written by St. Paul, right? And why? Well, we've talked about one of the things that accounts for this is that in the ancient world there were these scribes Monuensis, right, who basically their job was to be the scribe writing it down, and as the person would dictate, they would modify, fix, and change the wording a little bit to make it a little bit better, a little more presentable in a written style, right? And I, I've, I think, used the example before. We've all done this, right? If you've ever had a secretary, for example, or if you've ever been a secretary and taken dictation, right? You're writing it as the person is saying it, but you're fixing it, you're cleaning it up a little bit, right? In my law firm, some people still used, uh, especially when I first started, they were using dictaphones. And the lawyers would sort of dictate this letter into the dictaphone, and they'd give the little cassette tape to the secretary, and the secretary would type up the letter that the person had dictated, but they'd clean it up, right? They'd fix it a little bit. And so... It's not uncommon that different scribes resulted in some slightly different word choices and, and things like this. Well, then when you add to it, the letters that they are the most, that these scholars are the most critical of, are the very letters where St. Saint, Saint Paul specifically says he has a co-writer. He has a co-author of the letter with him, like Philippians, where he's got St. Timothy writing it with him. Well, um, if you've ever written something with someone else, right? I've had many of these happen. I write these long legal briefs, right? And I'd say, look, you know, uh, uh, Jim, Ted, whoever it was in my office, Denise, right? You write that section and I'll write this section, right? And then we would harmonize it. But if I harmonized it, even her sections sounded just a little bit like me. Right, And if she harmonized it, even my section sounded a little bit like her. But you could still tell that there were different authors for different sections of that thing. Right, And in the same way, when St. Paul's writing with a co-author, it's not surprising that his style is going to be a little bit different than when he's not writing with a co-author, but having a different amanuensis doing it. Right? Does this all make sense? Yes. And so... All of this energy that they put into this, all of this energy about, you know, who, who wrote this, who really wrote it, is utterly ridiculous and, and flies in the face of just normal common experience and in what we know about how things got written in the ancient world. Right? And so even though there are a lot of so-called educated people in the West who would hear us saying things like, a reading from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, or a reading from St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews, 
they would be shocked at that and say, oh, you simpletons, don't you know that the Greek is different? And all the Greek speakers, like St. John Chrysostom, would say, yes, we do, right? Um, so that's my little, my little aside, my little rant about the so-called educated scholars who only betray, you know, what, what's the old quote? A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or drink not the Pierian spring. For it is in shallow gulps that one is intoxicated and in deep draughts that one is sobered, something like that, right? And, and it's, the, it's a perfect example of that, right? They, they're only showing that they only know a little bit, not a lot. Okay. Um, it is most commonly believed to have been written in Rome during the 1960s when St. Paul was imprisoned there. And you'll see, for example, that note in the Orthodox Study Bible and plenty of other places. But as we talked about before with the letter um, to the Ephesians, for example, um, and, and, and others, there's some reason to suggest that maybe it was actually written by St. Paul when he's imprisoned briefly in Ephesus. He only makes some passing references to that. Um, but there's some reasons to suspect that, in part because we know See, we only, in the book of Acts, we only hear, ever hear of Timothy having gone ahead of St. Paul to Troas, and then we don't hear about him again. Okay. So there's some reason to think that maybe St. Timothy isn't in Rome with him. We do know that he becomes the bishop of Ephesus eventually, and maybe he stays there. He, he heads back there and then stays. It's not entirely clear, but there are some reasons to think maybe it was actually written in the 50s um, in Ephesus. Ultimately, it doesn't matter that much. We know that he's writing it from prison um, when things have gotten pretty bad. So where is Philippi? Well, there's actually a bunch of cities named Philippi because Philip, the Macedonian, loved in the, in the tradition of kings of the ancient world, he loved naming places after himself. And so he named a bunch of cities all over the place, Philippi. And so we, and we hear about some of them actually in the Bible, but this is the original Philippi because it's actually in Macedonia, right, right on the border of Macedonia and Thraki, Thrace, um, in, in northern uh, Greece. It's actually right near the closest island, right offshore there is Thassos, which um, is where our Euronis and Markella was, was raised in monasticism. Um, and um, what's interesting about it is that it's actually the site of the very decisive battle between Mark Antony and Augustus, or Octavian, who would become Caesar Augustus, versus Brutus and Cassius after the murder of Julius Caesar. Right? There's a civil war in, um, in Rome, and it's there, right outside Philippi, that the decisive battle is fought. Mark Antony wins, and it gives rise to the ability for Octavian Caesar Augustus to become Caesar. In um, gratitude for that, uh, Augustus gives many of the Roman soldiers land in that area. That was a very common thing. What the Romans would do is when they won, they would give the soldiers land, usually on the edges and the borders of the empire, as a way to Romanize the further reaches of the empire, right? It's a good way to, to keep control. Incidentally, an example of that, many of the men in my mom's side of the family are from the Falda region of Germany, and they have piercing blue eyes and dark hair. Well, when you go back and look at it, when Rome was fighting off the barbarians in that area, it was, I think, in the... the third century at some point, um, uh, fourth century maybe, they sent a whole detachment of Syrian mercenaries to that area of Germany. And when those Syrian mercenaries won and got peace, they were given land in that area and they settled down, married some very cute German honeys. And now all of a sudden there's a whole lot of people in that area with piercing blue German eyes and dark Syrian hair. 
Um, <laughs> right? So even now, all these centuries later, you can still see little pockets of that. Um, so the city actually became a very proud Roman city. It was very patriotic. Um, it became Colonia Augusta Iulia Philippensis, right? So they kept the Philippi in there, but of course they had to add it. Augustus had to add his name in there. And then, of course, to establish that it's in the, um, the tradition of Julius Caesar, he had to give his predecessor Julius a name in there too. Um, and so, but, you know, Philip was a pretty good guy to follow in the footsteps of, so he kept Philip's name in there too, right? Um, this is also, though, the first place that St. Paul preached on European soil. It's the first church, uh, or one of the first churches in Europe, and the first place that St. Paul preaches in Europe. Um, he founds the church there in the early 50s, and we read all about that in Acts 16. So if you're familiar with the book of Acts, this is where we first meet Lydia, a Jewish proselyte who ends up becoming baptized and becoming a major prominent woman within the church there in Philippi. It's where we meet, remember there's the, the men who have this slave girl who has a demon of dim, divination, right? She can tell the future, basically, this demon. And St. Paul ends up driving the demon out of her, and they end up getting really, really mad because he's caused this uproar and he's taken away their ability to get money. And so Paul and Silas get thrown into the jail, and they're singing hymns all night. And what happens? There's an earthquake, and the chains fall off. Right, And in the morning, the guard sees that the prison's open and the chains have fallen off, and he thinks that he's lost the prisoners. And so he knows that the penalty for that is death. And so he's about to commit suicide, and St. Paul stops him, right? And ends up baptizing his family. This is all happening at Philippi, right? So we, we know some pretty cool things about the history of Philippi and how St. Paul founded it. So this was in his second missionary journey. Um, all right, so that's where Philippi is. That's, that's who this city is. Does that make some sense? Um, so St. Paul begins this letter then with this beautiful prayer of thanksgiving. He's thanking God for the city in Philippi. We know that he has a special love for the people of, of Philippi, for the Philippian people. And the way we know that is St. Paul prides himself. He says multiple times in his letters that he doesn't accept gifts. Right? He doesn't accept gifts from anybody. There's one exception to this. He's very grateful in this letter and in another place for the gifts that he's received from the Philippians. He's very grateful for that. Right? He loved the Philippians so much. They were so close to his heart that when they sent him gifts, he went ahead and accepted them, right? Uh, it's this very sweet, touching little thing that sort of you, you sort of pass over and doesn't really land, right? But it's actually a really beautiful thing of showing and demonstrating this relationship between a spiritual father and his spiritual children, right? Um, and what he says, though, is... He begins by mentioning that he is following Christ's example. Remember, he's in prison. Right? He says, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Right? Because what was Christ? Christ lived for his Father. And yet to die was gain for him and for, well, really for us. Right? He gained us. Um, and, and he's going to then say, you too must follow Christ's example. This is the overall theme of this entire epistle is, who is Christ? We must follow his example. And let me show you how I'm living Christ's life so that you too can follow his example. Okay? Um, and so what is that example that he sets forward? It is Christ's humility. We have here the great hymn to Christ's humility in Philippians. This famous, famous hymn. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, 
did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Right? What a beautiful, beautiful reflection on the incarnation, the death and the resurrection of Christ, his humility, right? How he empties himself. We call this his his divine kenosis, right? His emptying of himself. What's clear in this hymn is that St. Paul is very, very explicitly calling Christ Yahweh, the God of Israel. Because he's quoting from Isaiah 45, where God says in Isaiah 45, Yahweh, the God of Israel, says, Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has it gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Right? So St. Paul takes these words that Yahweh says about himself and ascribes them to Christ. Right? It's a very clear and explicit declaration of Christ's divinity and equality with God. Right? As he's pointing out earlier, he then makes that tie very explicit. Right? I'd also point out, um, and I'm not going to harp on this too much, but as we've talked about when we talked in Romans and in Galatians and elsewhere, right? if the faith that the gospel is talking about is all about just simply you know, intellectual belief, marking the right boxes on the test. How can St. Paul then say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Right? What does it mean to work out my salvation if it's once saved, always saved? Right? Clearly, salvation is a process. Right? It's something that takes time, and it's something that takes work. <laughs> including fear and trembling, right? Um, and you got to do a whole lot of hand-waving to try and explain how that's something about intellectual assent, right? Or even assent in the heart, um, right? Um, all right. This is, incidentally, of course, the icon of Christ's burial. And what do we always call it? The extreme humility. Right? It's picking up from this section of St. Paul's epistle to the Philippians in an iconographic form. Right? He's in the form of a man obedient even unto death. Right? And that's his humility. He then goes forward and he first brings forward the examples of Saints Timothy and Epaphroditus. Right? They live the life of Christ's sacrifice out of love. Right? And he points out how both of them have been obedient to Christ and to him in serving him and in serving the people of God. Right? I'm going to guess that St. Timothy didn't draft this portion. <laughs> um, right? The um, Epaphroditus that he's mentioning, we celebrate him on March 30th. We know that he was one of the 70. He became the first bishop of Philippi. This is why he's bringing him forward as an example. Right? Um, maybe. So many of the 70 fell away. They walked away from him. And there are certain early that are being renewed. So chances are he's probably of the later part, right? Kind of like you would say St. Paul is an apostle of the 12, right? Same kind of thing. Um, 
And what's interesting is that St. Paul specifically refers to him. By, by the way, why is he there? He's the one who brings the gift from Philippi to Paul. He's the bishop, and he's the one who is sent by the people to bring this gift to St. Paul that he accepts. right? And then St. Paul lifts him up as an example of following Christ's service for, for his flock. right? Um, incidentally, how often have I seen, when I go to a parish, our bishop holding up to the people in that parish, their presbyter, his representative in that city, their spiritual leader and spiritual father, he'll make a point of you know, pointing out the good example that this priest is setting in order to help tie together the people to their spiritual father more closely. And this is exactly what St. Paul does with the Philippians here. Right? Um, St. Paul will also refer to him as a liturgos, right? a liturgist. Now, you know, this word at the time means basically somebody who is doing a public work on behalf of the people, right? And he's there, I think, referring, if I'm remembering right, to the bishop bringing him the gift. But it is this first example of where you're referring to a bishop as a liturgos. The work that he does on behalf of his flock is him acting as a liturgist. Right, I see that usage starting to come up there. St. Paul then goes on to, um, to then use himself as an example, to say, follow my example. He says, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, Right? What is this disowning of St. Stephen where they've thrown down their cloaks the feet of Saul? Right? Notice in this icon, no icon, no halo on him yet. Right? Um, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings be, being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. First of all, how many of us can say like Paul that we count everything that is not in Christ as rubbish? And the word he's using there is basically dung. Right? Can we say that? He then goes further and he says, um, right, this faith in Christ, we know the power of his resurrection. How? How is a man resurrected? It is through the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death so that we may attain the resurrection, right? What, what is that famous saying from the, the great law of Ramon Athos? If you die before you die, then you will not die when you die, right? Um, we have to die to ourselves. How do we experience in ourselves the resurrection? It is through being conformed to Christ's suffering and death. We must, there is a, a dual movement. St. Sophroni and St. Silouan talk about this so much, right? That there is this movement down. If we want to rise with him, we have to die with him. We have to descend to the depths of hell. And it's only then. Without, if we can do this without despairing, putting our faith in Him, being conformed to Him, then we will experience that resurrection. Right? That's the resurrection of Christ. We want to skip it all. Right? We want to skip that whole process. 
and begin to feel that resurrection in us, but we've not yet counted everything else as loss, as rubbish for Him. We've not allowed ourselves to die to this world and to ourselves, dying in Christ, and even going down into the depths of hell with Him. Right? What do we say in the psalm? Even if I go to Hades, you are there. Right? We read this every Orthros. Right? Even if I were to go to hell, you are there. Right? And without despairing, we, we allow ourselves to experience everything that he experienced so that then we can begin to live that resurrection in ourselves. Right? This is what St. Paul is calling us to. So what then does that look like? He gives the example of asceticism. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Right? He's running the race. He presses forward. He's running for that prize. Right? This is one of my favorite ultra runners. His name is Anton Kropichka out of Boulder, Colorado. And I just get a kick out of it because a lot of the trail runners, because he's got long hair and a beard, they all call him Trail Jesus. And, uh, <laughs> and so when I thought, what athlete do I need to put up here on the slide? I figured, well, it's got to be Anton. Um, God forgive me. Anyway, um, it's hard. He actually almost always is running like shirtless with cut off jean shorts like it's the 70s. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to find a picture of him with a shirt on. Thank God I did. Um, <laughs> in any event, um, uh, he says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, but they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. By the way, look at St. Paul's heart. Right? The enemies of the cross of Christ, what does he say? He weeps over them. Right? Even as he's going to bring forward them, he weeps over them. Right? Though whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. By the way, he's not talking specifically about pagans here. He's talking about me. Me. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able, even to subdue all things to himself. Right? Why do we engage in asceticism? It is because our citizenship is in heaven. Our God is not our belly. Right? And as a result of this, we allow him to begin to transform our body in his image, right? To be conformed to his glorious body. And how many of the saints have we heard about this, right? Last week we read the life of St. Mary of Egypt. What do we hear about this? She spent decades in the desert not eating, other than maybe a few little dandelion leaves or whatever, a few little plants, right? She gets there, what is she able to do? She walks right across the Jordan River, no problem, right? Um, she receives communion, and she travels many days' journey in a matter of an hour or two, right? Um, yeah, St. Elizabeth, exactly. I mean, and, and countless others, right? I mean, there's stories of, of um, Elder Ephraim being here in America, and yet people would call the monastery of Philotheu in Mount Athos and he'd pick up the phone because he knew that they needed to hear him and talk to him. And they'd say, Yaruda, we just saw you a few hours ago here in the United States. And he would just change the subject. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Don't we read this in Acts with St. Philip? Right? He baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch. And it gets in the clouds and gets carried away. Right? St. Thomas and all the apostles had the same thing happen at the, the um, Dormition, the chemesis of the Mother of God. Right? Countless other examples of this. Yes, St. Elizabeth. I mean, 
um, we heard about in the Senaphologios video, right? Senaphologios being raised off the ground in prayer. People saw this with St. John of San Francisco. He would glow with an actual halo as he would go to preach in the middle of the divine liturgy. There's even a picture of this out there. Um, countless other examples of this, right? Through their asceticism and through fundamentally they're claiming their citizenship in heaven now. They are conformed. They experience his resurrection and their bodies even now begin to be conformed to his. This is why we have incorruptible saints in the church. right? They're relics that don't fully corrupt because their body had already started to be conformed to Christ. Right? Um, he then gives a challenge to his people, to these people in Philippi. First, he talks about Avodia and um, Sintihi, who are quarreling with each other. They're fighting. These two members of the church, these two women in the church, are fighting with each other. They're quarreling. And he's begging them, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Basically, he's saying, be reconciled. Right? That's the first, the first challenge, is to be reconciled to each other. And if there are people who are not reconciled within the church, to be the agent of that reconciliation. Right? He then exhorts them, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Right? So pray, supplicate God, and give thanks in everything. Right? Allow our lives to be filled with prayer and with thanksgiving and with trust in Him, allowing Him to work things out, guarding our hearts and minds in Christ. And then finally, what does He say? Whatever is true, <laughs> my mother used to quote this to me anytime she'd hear me say a naughty word. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things in the God of peace that will be with you. How much of what we use to pass our time can be said to be just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise? How much of what I focus on, how much of what I spend my time thinking about, listening to, watching, reading, thinking about, is just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. This is how, according to St. Paul, we acquire the God of peace to be with us. We wonder why we're not peaceful. We don't feel at peace. And yet, we find our way busying ourselves with all, all sorts of things, whether bad or not, they're the kinds of things that St. Paul would call rubbish that are not just pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. Right? And then we wonder, why isn't God giving me peace? Right? And sometimes we even moving away from a spirit of prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, we start saying, hey Lord, you told me that you were going to give me peace in my life. Why aren't you giving me peace? And St. Paul answers us and says, excellent, pure, lovely, just, commendable, right? Um, it's one of the beauties of Lent. You know, we've we've... One of the unfortunate things is that we've become so focused on food 
because I think if there's one thing that we rich Americans, every one of us, has done is we've made our, you know, our bellies our gods. Um, we forget the other aspects of Lent, right? In Russia, for example, before the revolution, all of the theaters, the opera, everything closed down. Right? One of the big things about cheese fair was that you went to the opera or to a show because you weren't going to see another one for a long time. Right? Um, now, the opera and the theater live in our homes and live in our pockets. We carry it with us everywhere. Do we do anything to put blinders on? Anything. Right? Um, and, and countless other things. I mean, and we can even, I mean, look, it's very easy. I know there have been times where I said, well, okay, the news is different, right? So I'm not entertaining myself. I'm just staying informed, and I go watch the news. And I don't know about you, but I have yet to see a news broadcast that is just pure, lovely, commendable, <laughs> excellent, and worthy of praise, right? And if you don't think that news is now entertainment and that they're presenting it in a way that is meant to hook you and to keep you watching and to pump you full, not of the God of peace, right, but the God of discord and condemnation and judgment and violence. Right, right. Be anxious about everything, right? It's, what was the one I saw today about some, I forget, is it bird flu, swine flu? Yeah. Uh, mosquito flu, I don't know what it is. Yeah, the flu flu. Yeah, I know. There's another one. Yeah. Whatever it is. Um, so, you know, it's just what's the next thing, right? Yeah. Wars and rumors of wars and all these things. Um, anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Um, I used to always joke uh, in the law, whenever I'd make a mistake, I'd say, well, that's why they call it practicing the law. Uh, I'm just practicing. Um, but it's true in the Christian life, too. We're just practicing. Right? We keep going. Um, I mean, as an aside, it's also why... Um, if you ever think you want to be a priest, go read St. John Chrysostom's six books on the priesthood, and if it doesn't make you a little tremble, right? Because this is one of the things that St. John Chrysostom actually points out very, very much, is that as a spiritual father, your children, your children will be looking to you for the example of how to live the spiritual life. And, you know, we've... Um, I have to be really careful here because you can very quickly go into just rank hypocrisy. But um, you know, one of the things that you hear a lot of times about being clergy is, well, make sure, you know, you got to be yourself, you got to be yourself, you got to be yourself, you got to be relatable. Um, you know, we're in the era of authenticity, right? That's the word that everybody loves to use. That's all fine. Yes, be yourself. But if you want then to be clergy, you better be a self that people can look up to, particularly a spiritual father, a self that people can look up to then to see the example of how to put into practice the things that you're telling them to do. Right? Um, And, and it's, I mean, if it doesn't make you pause for a moment um, and, and make you realize what a hypocrite uh, I am. I mean, it's, it's really, right, it's this powerful moment that St. John Chrysostom calls us to, to. And so, yes, you have to be yourself and you have to be authentic. Um, but then what does that mean then that I need to be authentically? 
Um, right? St. Paul does this throughout his epistles. He's constantly calling them back to exactly this. Do the things that you saw me doing. Right? Follow my example. Let me show you. Let me show you the ropes. Right? And, um, and this is appropriate. Right? I mean, how else? Right? Kids learn from their parents, right? They pick up what their parents are doing, whether the parents like it or not. Right? <laughs> exactly. Um, they know what we're doing. And if we think that somehow spiritual children and spiritual parents are different, we've got another thing coming. Right? Um, this is not to scare away people who are called to the priesthood, but only to say, be better than me. Um, uh, you know, and it's, and it's the daily work of being a Christian that he's talking about, right? I purposefully chose here a mother with her children lighting the candles, not, you know, uh, a, a monk doing a thousand prostrations on a rock. Right? That's good too. <laughs> but this is asceticism of its own. So too is going to work and being a good employee who doesn't grumble, who doesn't partake in the office politics, who doesn't um, uh, you know, speak ill of his coworkers or his boss or whoever else, and so many other things, right? Finally, what St. Paul says is he tells us to rejoice. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Right? And this is the thing that I think is so easy. I mean, we get it this time of year. We start to kind of get it, right? Because uh, right, Pascha is this just incredibly joyous moment. But if you've ever met somebody truly holy, you know that they live in that moment. Right? You can see them in their heart rejoicing even when they weep over their sins. There's a joy that comes with that. They're beginning to experience, as he said earlier in the epistle, they're beginning to experience the resurrection in themselves. Right? And so St. Paul tells us to rejoice. Right? Um, to, yes, be crucified with Christ. Yes, to weep for our sins. Yes, to restrain ourselves. And all of these things that he's talking about. And in all of it, rejoice. Rejoice. We're citizens of heaven. right? Christ has offered all of this. He has died and resurrected. He humbled himself, taking on flesh, dying and rising, so that we too can die and rise with him and experience that resurrection and receive that peace. How can we not rejoice? Right? And so that's where St. Paul leaves us tonight, especially as we look forward to Holy Week and Pascha next week. Uh, this is, of course, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the passing of the Holy Light on Holy Saturday. Right? Um, let us, in these last days of Lent and throughout the course of Holy Week, let us allow ourselves to truly be transformed in mind and in heart and in body the way that St. Paul talks uh, about. Be conformed to his death and experience his resurrection and in all of it rejoicing. Any questions or, or thoughts before we move on? All right. Well, um, I'm excited. I love, there, there's a, I don't have any way of pulling that up right now. It's a wonderful hymn that we'll sing at the Pre-Sanctified Liturgy on Friday um, uh, for those places that, that serve it, talking about having now fulfilled the 40 days, looking forward to uh, Jerusalem, basically. And I absolutely love the hymn. It's always this sort of, you know, okay, now it's, like, now it's the real deal. Let's get ready. Let's go, right? Um, and uh, we reached that place. Um, yeah. Glory to God for that. Kalyanastasi.
and uh, Kalapaska. And uh, we obviously won't have anything next week, um, but we should be back right Wednesday. Um, and um, if I'm awake, there's that old, <laughs> the old saying that it applies as much to deacons as it does to priests, you know. Uh, Christ may be risen, but the priest is dead. <laughs> so, good strength to all of you. Pray for me, and um, we'll go from there. Through the prayers of the Holy Father, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, immerse us and save us. Amen. Yeah.